Okay, and this tape here, what we are going to do is we're going to look at some of the reactions that the benzene ring does when it's a part of a compound. Mostly what we're going to see here in this section is reactions that we already know. We're just going to look at how the benzene ring affects them. That's not where we're going to start, however. We're going to start with a totally new reaction, and this is called side chain oxidation. Okay, so in the first case here, we're going to take the simple molecule toluene, shown here, and we're going to treat it with a strong oxidant, either this chromium-6 oxidant or potassium permanganate. And under these conditions, you can completely oxidize toluene all the way to benzoic acid. Okay, what's kind of remarkable about this reaction is that it cleaves carbon-carbon bonds, okay? So when you take the compound here called propyl benzene under the same reaction conditions, you also get the exactly the same compound benzoic acid. You effectively cleave the carbon-carbon bond that I've shown right there. And this carbon-carbon bond cleavage slash oxidation can occur for any system. The only requirement is that you have benzylic hydrogens, okay? So I'll just underline the benzylic hydrogens, okay? Right here, right here. These are benzylic hydrogens. These are hydrogens at the benzylic position. Okay. The side chain oxidation proceeds for any compound that contains benzylic hydrogens. The mechanism for this process is kind of complex and we're not going to present it and frankly I'm not sure it's really all that well known anyway. Okay. In living systems a very similar thing occurs. Okay. So toluene in a living system can undergo oxidation in the presence of uh, cytochrome P450 uh, and an enzyme to uh, convert to benzoic acid as well. Okay, and this actually serves as a mechanism for detoxifying things. When it comes to the relative toxicity of toluene versus benzene, we find that toluene is much less toxic than benzene. And this is because it has this oxidation pathway available to it. Benzene, it's harder for your body to get rid of it, and it ends up being a far more toxic compound because of that. Okay, let's look at the reaction in some real systems. So here I'm asking you to do a little problem here. Let's predict the product of each reaction. As before, like when we're in class and whatever, what you should do to put yourself in the frame of mind for an exam is to just pause the tape right here and try to complete the answer on your own and then restart it when you're ready to go through with it. Okay, so in each case we're looking just to oxidize any side chain that contains benzylic hydrogens. So in the top case we're going to oxidize, we're going to cleave the CC bond right there and we're going to do an oxidation that produces uh, the corresponding carboxylic acid. The chlorines that you see here aren't going to be affected by this reaction. They're just going to go along for the ride, and this is the compound that we're going to get here. Okay, the next one has two different alkyl groups. However, one is a tertiary butyl group. Uh, let's draw out what a tertiary butyl butyl group is. Okay. basically right here. And what you find here is that there are no benzylic hydrogens. Okay, and as a result, when you do this oxidation right here, you don't do anything to the T-butyl group, you don't do anything to the chlorine, but this other side chain, uh, it's actually quite a massive side chain as you can see here, undergoes the oxidation smoothly to produce this compound. It also produces another mystery compound that has 600 carbons in it. I'm going to guess and say that it might be that carboxylic acid right there, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Okay, in the next case, 
we're going we have a cyclic uh, or the benzene ring is fused to another ring but uh, we should just see these two ring residues here it's just alkyls that's an alkyl and that's another alkyl group and when we do this oxidation here we're just going to get the dicarboxylic acid that you see right here in this bottom case we have a naphthalene ring system and the oxidation also oxidizes away the rings all the rings recall as, as you see here let me just draw that in remind you that each one of these rings does have benzylic hydrogens let me just draw the benzylic hydrogens here for fun so that you can just verify that they're there the only complication here is that this one has an extra carboxylic acid group on it and uh, as a result what you see is that we carry that one along for the ride and we end up with a compound that has five carboxylic acid groups in it. Okay, so this is a kind of a unique reaction. The rest of the reactions we're going to talk about in this section are just merely derivatives of other reactions you've already seen. Okay, the next reactions we're just going to look at the benzylic carbocation. Okay, um, and the benzylic free radical. What we find here is that these carbocations and radicals are stabilized by resonance. So let's look at the benzylic carbocation. Okay, we can write resonance structures. Recall let's, uh, that what we're doing here is we're just moving the double bonds uh, in like that and swapping the location of the carbocation and the double bond. And what we find here is that we delocalize the positive charge at uh, this ortho position, at the para position, and at the other ortho position. So we delocalize the positive charge site over several atoms. If you're wondering what is the most stable of these resonance structures, it's actually the one that we started with. This is the most stable. Okay. Okay, because this one still retains the uh, aromatic character. Okay, so this one retains the aromatic character right here. Okay, let's look at the radical. The radical, we can see the same type of resonance interaction right here. Okay, the radical is delocalized over the ortho and para positions in exactly the same way the carbocation. As before, this is the most stable form of the free radical. So when we look at the reactions of the benzylic free radical, we do not have to worry about uh, capture of the radical through something like this. Let's uh, just imagine that this reacts with bromine. Okay, we're never going to see bromine react there. We're only going to see bromine react here. Okay, because this is the only capture that will retain the aromatic ring character. Okay, let's look at some other cases. All right, SN2 reactions. They're all, benzylic systems are also accelerated here. Let's look at benzyl chloride. This bond is weaker than the typical bond to chlorine, uh, of chlorine to a primary carbon. Therefore, uh, it's a little easier to break it. And also, if you look at the transition state for an SN2, there's this uh, p orbital that's got the nucleophile and bromine on both sides of it. But there's some degree of overlap of this p orbital when uh, this system is here. Okay? All right. So all of these reactions are, are carbocations are stabilized by benzene rings and SN2 reactions are uh, accelerated to some extent when uh, a benzene ring is right beside the center of reaction. Okay. 
So let's look at some questions that might arise from this. Okay, uh, which compound undergoes solvolysis at the fastest rate? Again, you should try and do this one yourself. Uh, and if you want to, just pause it, and then you can just restart it. And what you'll see is that I'm immediately going through the answer. Okay, questions like this, the why forms most of the credit. Why? Because you have a 50% chance of getting it right if the only aspect of this question is guessing which is of these is going to react at the faster rate. Okay, solvolysis. What do we know about solvolysis? Okay, solvolysis is an SN1 reaction. Okay, and what do we know about SN1 reactions? Carbocations are involved. Okay, so we are going to be looking at a reaction that involves carbocations. Okay, so what we want to think about is the carbocation that go that we get by just breaking the carbon chlorine bond in a heterolytic fashion. Okay, pointer options pin. Okay, there's a lot of extra red ink on this slide. I am sorry about that, but here's the answer. So all this is an S and one process, uh, and we compare the relative stability of the carbocations. System A gives us a carbocation here that is both benzylic and tertiary, and this is much better than the carbocation here, which is merely tertiary. Okay? Okay, so re reaction A is faster because it proceeds through the most stable, resonance-stabilized carbocation. And again, uh, if we were just asking which is the better SN1 substrate, that's another way of asking this reaction. A is obviously better because it goes through the more stable carbocation. Okay, what is the more likely product of the following reactions, and why? Okay, first reaction is the addition of HCl to this double bond. We know that the addition of HCl occurs in a Markovnikov fashion, right? And that's in fact true. But what's Markovnikov in this system? What we see is that both ends of this double bond are equally substituted. So which of, this, of these is the Markovnikov product? Well, it's not quite so simple. So let's see if we can go through the mechanism for this process and figure out which it should be. Okay, so we protonate the double bond. We get either the carbocation on the top, which is secondary and benzylic, or we get the carbocation on the bottom, which is just merely secondary. Okay, this is the better carbocation. So, this is going to produce this compound here as the expected product. Okay, so we should be making this compound because making this compound involves chlorine attacking the more stable carbocation in the last step. And recall from chapter 6, that is the way all of these reactions, or all of those reactions, proceeded. You make the best carbocation and you capture it with some nucleophile, often a halide, often something else. Okay, what is the major product of the reaction below? KOH and ethanol is reacting with the compound, with the iodide you see there, and this is producing either A, B, or C. Okay, so the first issue is substitution versus elimination. Secondary halide. Strong base. We're not going to get any A because this is a recipe. We're going to get elimination over substitution in a system like this. Okay, so we're going to get either B or C, and which is better between B or C? Okay, so the dehydrohalogenation uh, proceeds according to Seitzef's rule, right? 
and should be producing the more stable compound. Not just merely the more substituted compound, but the more stable compound. And B and C are both E2 products, but we should be producing B. B should be our major product, right? Because it is conjugated. The alkene group is conjugated to the benzene ring, whereas in C, the alkene group is isolated from the benzene ring. There is an sp3 carbon or two separating the alkene from the benzene ring. Okay, so we predict that compound B should be the major product from the reaction below. Okay, predict the major product of each reaction and provide a mechanistic rationale for why your product and no other product should form. These are just reactions where we replace hydrogen with either bromine or chlorine. Um, and recall from the previous chapter, chapter 10, that NBS would take the allylic hydrogen and selectively replace that hydrogen with a bromine. Well, the same thing is going to happen in these systems, except we're going to replace the benzylic hydrogen with a bromine. Okay, so we're going to obtain the product shown here. Uh, this is going to arise from the reaction of bromine with this radical right here. This radical is secondary and benzylic, whereas the alternate radical that you get from removing hydrogen at sp3 carbon, this one is it's just secondary, so it's not as likely to form. Okay, and the next one, it's kind of an interesting system here. We have actually, actually all the hydrogens at sp3 carbon in the bottom are benzylic, but uh, you should probably expect the product shown here to be the product, okay? Because when you look at this radical, this one is doubly benzylic. It's stabilized by both benzene rings at the same time, so this hydrogen here should be much easier to remove. This radical here is only uh, stabilized by only one. benzene ring, okay? And it's less likely to form. All right, so the product from attacking bromine there is less likely to form. This is the predicted product up here. Okay, what are we going to get in the bottom case? The bottom case, we're going to replace one of the, the benzylic hydrogen with chlorine, and this should be the expected product forming from this radical here. This radical here is benzylic. Any other radical that you make would either be primary, secondary, or tertiary. Uh, and that's not quite as good as benzylic. Okay, let's just look at the top reaction and go through the mechanism completely, or not completely, but at least the initiation and propagation steps. Okay, so uh, there's the complete balanced reaction equation. Let's see. Let's remember what this is. Sometimes it's a little, we use it so much that it's often forgotten as to what NVS actually is, but that's it in bromo imid. Okay, so we have an initiation step, and a key thing to remember before we look at this is uh, this reaction equation here, where MBS and HBr are reacting to make succinimid and Br2. Because of that, we can really use Br2 as the source of bromine in the reaction mechanism. I'm going to say, if your system is really, really pure and you don't have any bromine around to any extent, the initiation step would be the breaking the NBr bond of MBS, but more than likely there's some bromine there, and if that's the case, it's more than likely that uh, you would initiate the reaction by breaking the bromine-bromine bond to make two bromine radicals. Okay, regardless of how it initiates, we're making a bromine radical. Okay, bromine radical 
pulls off the benzylic CH bond. Okay, I'll just show this with a half-headed arrow. Okay, and that makes our uh, benzylic radical NHBr. Okay, and let's uh, show this one with a half-headed arrow also. This then reacts there, and this gives us the other product of the reaction, and bromine radical, bromine radical re-enters the reaction cycle, and this keeps propagating and propagating over and over. Uh, this reaction ends with termination steps, however, they're not really that hard to figure out. You just take every radical that you made and think about combining them. They're not really the most important steps in the product. You can do that yourself for fun, but in any mechanism I would probably only ask you to come up with the initiation and propagation steps. Okay. Here's an SN2 based question. Predict the product of each reaction. Okay, so in the first one we are taking a molecule that has two chlorines and treating it with exactly one mole of sodium azide. Uh, this carbon is primary. This carbon here is primary and benzylic. So we're going to actually substitute the lower one, and this should be the expected product of this reaction. Primary halides are pretty good, but uh, the one at the bottom is better. Okay, this one we're going to treat it with uh, allyl sulfide anion. Uh, in this case, I'm only going to incorporate one mole, and I could actually treat this with any mole, any number of moles that I wanted because one part of this reaction is unreactive. This is a halogen at sp2 carbon. It's uh, unreactive in the SN2. Okay, so this reaction is going to occur completely selectively at the other bromine, and this is the product you would get regardless of what we, how many moles of this uh, nucleophile we added. Okay, sodium methoxide, DMSO, this is a tertiary and benzylic. Key thing here though is that it's tertiary and uh, it's a lousy SN2, E2 usually wins. Uh, so the expected product here is the E2 elimination forming that product. The other bromine is just like it is in the other system. It's uh, unreactive uh, to our nucleophile. It's also unreactive to any base uh, except for like a really, really strong base. But uh, sodium methoxide DMSO doesn't. needs to be much stronger than that as we'll see later in chapter 12. Okay, all right, so this is the expected product of this reaction. Okay, uh, so this is where I'm going to stop this tape and we're going to look at other conjugated systems in the next uh, tape, part three.